Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent, licensed in all 50 states. I want to welcome everybody on all major podcast platforms listening to us today, and also on the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel, where you can view me and the guest interacting and laughing and facial expressions and all that stuff. But uh, without further ado, I want to introduce and go through kind of the background of our guest today, which I'm so excited that he's joined us. His name is John Olson. Um, he's an author, he's an educator, and he can literally be called an annuity expert. In fact, he's one of the few people on the planet that I can confidently call annuity royalty. I've been a friend of his for a long, long time and a follower. He's a thought leader um, in the annuity space, even though he's kind of semi-retired right now and kind of focusing on his guitar and his, you know, all of his stuff that he does, his research and World War II research and all that stuff. But uh, he's done a lot. But in 2015, after being with numerous companies, et cetera, he started Olson Annuity Education, uh, which is, it does exactly what it sounds like it does. It, it educates people on annuities. Um, he is an expert on annuity taxes. Um, he doesn't do a lot of that now, but in the past, he was the go-to person for that. And he was on, on the editorial advisory board for Tax Facts, which is kind of a resource for all of us out here in the financial services business. Now he's written a lot of books and co-authored a lot of books. Let me just go through a few of them. He's the co-author of The Advisor's Guide to Annuities. He's the co-author of Indexed Annuities, A Suitable Approach. He's the author of Taxation and Suitability of Annuities for the Professional Advisor. And he's also authored the timeless classic of Read. The title of the book is called Read This Before Buying Any Annuity. I mean, it's just perfect. Um, and the one of the most fascinating books he's ever written, in my opinion, it's titled The Advisor as a Defendant, How to Keep from Being Sued Successfully. He's trying to help the advisor to do the right thing and be a fiduciary before fiduciary was the go word, the go-to word. And then finally, one of the best books ever written on the annuity uh, topic, John Olson's Guide to Annuities for the Consumer. Now you can go to his site at olsonannuityeducation.com, but you can also go to my site at theannuityman.com because we'll have a page that has John's uh, information, links where you can buy his books and you can replay this podcast, et cetera. Now, a little bit about him personally, he lives in Kirkwood, Missouri, Missouri as the Southerners say, with his wife, Catherine, and, and a cat that runs the show. Um, I think the cat's name is Calpurnia. Um, he enjoys teaching, he's a teacher, he's an educator, he's a writer, he loves to read, he loves classical music, he smokes a few cigars, and he, and he likes to argue almost anything because he wins. <laughs> he's, you're going to find out when he starts talking that this cat knows what he's talking about. Um, he calls himself an adequate pistol shot, a decent folk guitarist, and a pretty crappy golfer, um, which he's just a worldly guy. He, he loves uh, uh, World War II history, calligraphy. I mean, he does a lot. And you're going to see him if you're watching the Fun with Annuities YouTube channel. You'll see in the background a library just packed full of books. John is a uh, voracious reader and learner. And with that, I want to welcome to the Fun with Annuities podcast, Annuity Royalty, John Olson. John, thank you for, thank you for joining us. Oh, Sam, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, gosh, I appreciate all of your very kind words. Uh, yeah, I've been in I've been in the annuity business, the financial services industry, since February of 1973. There you go. I retired for the most part in 2012, uh, but I still did uh, quite a bit of uh, expert witness testimony, which was the origin of my, the book that you mentioned, how to keep from being sued successfully. <laughs> right. I represented both. Uh, plaintiff and defendant, and I found something interesting that I think your your viewers would find interesting, and that's that 
in the cases that I worked on, which were uh, cases in front of a court or a FINRA arbitration that alleged that a, an unsuitable annuity sale had been made, uh, and I've looked at both sides, the, the, the plaintiff and the defendant, I can count on one hand the number of cases in which the agent who's, who missold a case was really a bad guy. For the rest of them, he simply, he or she simply didn't know any better at all. There, there are, there's a great deal of misunderstanding about annuities, particularly even more than life insurance, because they can be very complicated. And as yes. Stan and I were talking about yesterday, the, the more recent products are so difficult. Jack Marion and I sat in the Ritz Carlton Cigar Club for 20 minutes reading a brochure, a sales brochure on a variable annuity that had a certain kind of step up rider. Uh, after 20 minutes, I looked at Jack and said, I don't understand it, do you? And he said, no. And by the way, Jack Marion is also annuity royalty, and he's the co-author of uh, the book that uh, John co-authored with him called Index Annuities, A Suitable Approach. And, and those two, John and Jack, pretty much laid the foundation of facts when it surrounds index annuities, annuities in general. But, um, you know, from a suitability standpoint, John, and, you know, this is a consumer's podcast and, and also a YouTube channel where consumers are, are trying to figure out, do annuities fit? Or do they make sense? Go through why that is so important for the annuity industry and the consumer themselves, the suitability part of annuities and the purchase of annuities. Well, thank you, Stan. Yes, it, it is important. It's critical. Let's, let's look at the word suitability. What does it really mean? It means, uh, is this product that is being recommended to you, does it do the things that you want it to do that are your goals? And does it avoid doing the things that you don't want it to do, uh, your, dis your, your disfavored? It's a question of suitability is when you look at it and it's, it's the thing that you wanted to do. For example, if you're of, let's say you're 65 years old, I'm just using an example, and you've decided that you need an income starting today, mm -hmm. and it has to persist for as long as you do, for life, or perhaps for the, your lifetime and your spouse's lifetime. It has to do that. That's critical. And you say, well, I not only needed to do that, but I need to know the amount, and I need to know that amount will never go down. There's one product that does that spectacularly well. It's called a fixed immediate annuity. Right. Sometimes it, called it a single premium immediate annuity. Right. Single pre Yes. Thank you. You mm -hmm. can either pay it, uh, buy it with one lump sum, or buy it with a series of installments. But why does it work? because that's all it does. It provides an income for you and or you and your wife. Or right. And it guarantees, period, this amount of money is gonna be paid to you. Or it could go up every year by what's called a cost of living rider that nobody wants anymore because they're so darned expensive. Right. They reduce the amount of income you'd get. But that's what they do. What don't they do? Well, they're not savings instruments. Right. In fact, after you buy it, you don't have the money that you paid anymore. It's gone. Right. It's gone because you traded it. You traded it for a stream of income. By contrast, let's say that you're 35 or, or 45, whatever, and you don't uh, want the money today. You want to have an income commencing at retirement, let's say 65. And it needs to go for life, uh, or yours and your spouse's. Uh, and you're willing to take some risk to get a pretty good return. Well, I've defined a couple of different products will work, but typically a variable deferred annuity would be something you would want to look at. 
On the other hand, if you say, look, I'm, I'm really, I'm really worried about what's going to be happening in the future. And by the way, if you're not, you should be. Uh, you might say, I, I want to have that income, but I don't want to lose any money. I, I don't want my principal to go down. Uh, in that case, you would want a deferred annuity, but it would be what is called fixed. That doesn't refer to the interest rate. It refers to the fact that when you ask what's the co uh, contract worth, it's measured in dollars, fixed dollars. Right. And, and to go through the products, you know, um, just, just to interrupt a little bit here, obviously I've written books on all of these products. You can get them at my site. You can run quotes at my site 24 seven, 365. Um, but, but I always ask John, I always ask two questions to people. What do you want the money to contractually do? And when do you want those contractual guarantees to start? And then from there, we, you, we just kind of drill down on the, uh, and shop for the highest contractual guarantee for that situation. Um, I want your insight on, how how do the annuity carriers approach suitability? I think that there's a misconception out there in the in this in the consumer world with annuities that the annuity ca carriers don't care. They're just trying to sell. They just want their agent army out there sell sell sell. I tell people all the time the you know the annuity industry can't regulate what an agent says, but they're very serious about suitability and appropriateness of the product. Can you go into that from the carrier side? Because I know that you, you know, used to um, speak with them on a regular basis and advise the industry. Where does that land and, and why should the, cust the consumer be feel comfortable with the suitability approach from the carriers in the industry? Uh, thank you, Stan. Uh, years ago, decades ago, I'm afraid that that uh, statement from Stan, they don't, they don't care, they just want to sell, sell, sell. Decades ago, that was the case with an awful lot of them. Wow, okay. It's not the case anymore. No, it's not. Now, why? For one thing, they have recognized that uh, they have obligations that perhaps they didn't recognize before. But it, it, they're also driven by the consumer forces that have have over the, uh, the years said, look, we, we demand that you guys put into place some kinds of procedures, policies, et cetera, to make sure that when one of your agents sells a, a contract, an annuity contract, that it's the right thing for the client. And now I can say with considerable uh, uh, certainty that there are companies that are extremely uh, not only interested, but determined to get the right product. And an agent, for example, now uh, with almost every company has to fill out a suitability questionnaire. And what does it ask? It says, well, how much net worth does this client have? Mm -hmm. How much income does this client have? What is the, what is the age, of course? What, do, what are they trying to do uh, and where, what kinds of investments do they have? Uh, because we want to know what else they have if we're, if we're recommending an addition to the products that they own. These things are now required and agent training is now mandated in just about every state so that you as consumers, can have considerable uh, certainty that mo that there, the agent will have been told you've got to do it suitably and has been, and has been trained in how to do that. Uh, some companies are better than others. I would say if you're a, a consumer and so and an agent is recommending uh, asking to come over and talk about annuities there are a few things you should do first. Number one, if you have access to a computer and you know that that agent recommends a company, find out about that company. Find let, out me what stop you, let me stop you right there. I don't think agents should recommend a company. You know, well, I, I, th agree. I, th but I think it should be, if agree. you're looking, you know, and I know you didn't mean it statically like that, but people should understand if you're looking for a solution, you know, remember my two questions, what do you want the money to contractually do and when do you want those contractual guarantees to start? 
that agent should be able to show you three to 10, three minimum companies that provide that solution to you. If, if an agent says, I've looked at it and this is the best one I think for you, that's, that's not a sufficient answer. I, I agree with you, Stan, but there are a lot of agents who recommend only one. And I, I simply wanted to look at that scenario. Sure. Absolutely dead right. Um, the agents who can rec, uh, work with more than one company, and that's most agents these days, mm -hmm. has an obligation to go shopping, which is what Stan does. Yeah, exactly. Indeed, what I did for my clients. I, I didn't recommend one company. Sure. I looked at all of them. But there are some things you want to do. First of all, if the A, if the uh, you want to, I, I think you should write down. Write down what you want, what you don't want. And in writing it down, it'll help you to clarify exactly what your goals are and what you, your things you want to avoid. And then when someone recommends, uh, comes in with three to 10, uh, I've always liked three. I uh, personally, I'm not sure I could handle 10, but um, I don't disagree with Stan saying, you want to be sure that this agent has gone shopping. Sure. When, when the agent rec sits down with you, a couple of things are, are really important. Number one, if that agent talks about any feature or whatever in that annuity with the sales brochure and glides over it, and you didn't understand what he, he or she said, you need to say, you know, I didn't understand what you said. Could you explain that a little better? And if what you get is a repetition of, well, you know, it's so-and-so, find another agent. Well, and I always say, John, that if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, don't buy it. No offense yeah. to nine-year-olds. When I was first learning insurance back in the 70s, uh, I started a pro progress of, I'm sorry, a process that I uh, used until uh, I retired. I, when I had a new thing that I wanted to look at, I would explain it to my wife, who is a very, very smart lady, but she's not an annuity expert. And then I would say, explain it back to me. Right. She could not do that. It was my fault. I didn't make it clear. So if you have an agent who's talking to you about income writers or whatever, mm -hmm. you need to know what it will do, yeah. what it won't do. And if that agent can't explain it correctly, uh, just say, thank you very much and Agreed. find another agent. And I always uh, tell people, if it sounds too good to be true, it is every single time without exception absolutely. with annuities. Um, you've got to be very careful. I, if I had a vote, and, and I told, I told my, my CEO this the other day, if there was a person that I could appoint as annuity czar, other than myself, of course, John, it would be you. Um, if you're annuity czar, and let's just hypothetically look at that, how would you make this industry better because with 10,000 baby boomers reaching age 65 every single day, I call that a demographic tidal wave of people looking for solutions, transfer of risk, contractual guarantees, etc. What would you do to improve the industry appeal and also reputation? What would you do? Uh, well, the first thing I would do, most insurance agents do not want to hear this, but I am very sincere about it. I would say if you are going to recommend index annuities, you need to have a special license. I agree. And let's stop right there. And part of that licensure would be they would have to read and take a test on the book that, that John co-authored with Jack Marion called Index Annuities, A Suitable Approach. That would, be the, that would be the book, but go further. I'm so for this, John, I can't tell you. So you're saying it, it to sell fixed index annuities, the go-go product right now, the bad chicken dinner product of choice, you have to have a separate license, correct? And the reason I believe that is that the insurance license uh, that uh, examination in every state 
is pretty darned easy. Yeah. And it doesn't require in-depth understanding. Index annuity products, most of them are relatively complicated. Many of them are so complicated that even experts have trouble understanding. Yes. I can tell you and not be um, worried that I'm saying the wrong thing, that most agents, more than half, don't understand what they're selling. I agree with that. Uh, I think that's being generous. Well, uh, I, would, I would put the percentage higher, actually. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, when I used to give uh, presentations around the country to, to agents, I would ask, don't raise your hands because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but <laughs> how many people have actually read the annuity contract? I would bet that the percentage is not higher than 5%. Right. They read the ma marketing material. Right. And they say that's enough. It's not. The, the agent needs to understand what it will do and what it won't do. Let me give you some examples that you might want to use if you are considering an index annuity. Uh, most of them are being sold today with what are called income riders. And they mm -hmm. simply provide, in addition to the regular contract, a guaranteed income under certain conditions. And that, that uh, rider has a cost, an yes. annual cost. By the way, index annuities typically have no annual cost and no front end cost, uh, except if there's a rider like this. So the rider might say it's going to cost you 75 basis points. That's, that's uh, insurance speak for three quarters of 1% per year. And they'll say that's what it is. Okay. But if I'm able to increase the guaranteed amount due to how well my contract is, has uh, been performing, which is called a step up option and most of them have it. Does, does that mean my cost will still be 75 basis points? No, it doesn't. In most contracts, the, the fee will go up. Correct. That's, it's important when you say, okay, is that, is that the current cost? Uh, what is the guaranteed cost? Uh, you're saying that uh, this uh, can give me an interest rate, let's say it's a multi-year guarantee annuity. Sure. Uh, interest rate of 4%. For how long is that 4% guarantee? Right. And after the guarantee, what is the minimum that they can give me? Right. Now, and can uh, we transfer it after the surrender charge to get a higher rate or move it, et cetera? Right. I, you know, I totally agree with that. Mike, I got a question for you. Most people just cavalierly say that they hate all annuities because they've seen the ad and I always say, well, if you hate all annuities, then you hate your social security payment because that's an annuity payment. If you hate all annuities, you hate your pension because that's an annuity. Um, how would you combat the I hate all annuity mantra out there if you're the annuity czar? Okay, well, number one, the problem is education and it's a long-term solution. But those people who say, and I've talked with attorneys and accountants who say basically that, well, uh, I hate all annuities. And I used to give continuing education to accountants. And periodically, I'd get somebody and I'd say, okay, why? Well, I hate them. No, no, why? Yeah, exactly. And we would examine each one. Well, they're too expensive. You sure. know, that's absolutely possibly correct of one kind of annuity. Right. Variable deferred annuity, particularly with an income rider, could cost you more than 3% per year. For the but life of the policy. With no rider will cost you zero dollars per year. So where are all the fees you're talking about? Typically, here's what happens. And they talk about annuities as if they're all the same. Right. And I tell my students this. Any sentence that begins with annuities are dot, 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 should not even be finished because it'll be nonsense. Right. It's like saying all vehicles have four wheels. It's like saying I hate all restaurants or I hate all trucks um, when you say yeah. I hate all annuities. It, it, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. But I do think the annuity industry has not done a good job of a consistent, simplistic message um, of what annuities do, which is tra Absolutely. they transfer risk. They're risk 
transfer products, their risk yes. transfer contracts. And I don't know why they keep gravitating toward the growth story, John. I guess it's because it's the sexy thing to do. But in my opinion, we should be talking about the transfer risk guarantees that these annuity types, specific annuity types provide instead of talking about potential hypothetical theoretical back tested stuff. By the way, on the back tested, I know back tested is, is illegal in some states where you say, well, if you owned it 10 years ago, this index annuity, you know, this is what you're going to earn. Um, what's your take on that? Would you allow back testing? I have never, I've rarely seen back testing that I had any respect for at all. And here's why. They will say, okay, uh, this particular index annuity is going to give you 60% of whatever is, let's say, the S&P 500. Uh, you're going to get 60% uh, if it goes up, but if you go down, you're going to get nothing. That's a typical index annuity. And they'll say, okay, we're, if you had bought this annuity in 1975, how would you have done? And they look at the index that you picked and they, they back test but they back test using that 60%, which would not have been the case every year. That percentage, right. which by the way is not guaranteed, that percentage can go up and down because the market goes up and down and the risk goes up and down. But Stan just said something that I hope you all will listen to. These are investments to a degree. But most annuities are, in, are risk management tools. Right. There are only a few things you can do with risk. You can assume it, you can eliminate it, you can reduce it, or you can transfer it. Let's right. say the risk is that you're going to have an auto accident. You can get rid of it. Don't, don't, don't drive. You can reduce it. Well, drive better. <laughs> uh, you can... Um, you can uh, retain it. Uh, well, I'm not going to have any insurance. Or you can transfer it and say, I can't handle that risk. Uh, you all do that with your homeowner's insurance and your life insurance. I can't handle the risk that I would die tonight and my, my family needs an income, but it's died with me. Or my home burned down. Most people can't afford to, to build their, their home again. So they transfer the risk. That's what annuities do. And I would tell insurance companies, look, you don't do that. You don't talk about risk transfer, and I know why. I've heard insiders uh, from insurance companies say, the public won't understand that. Well, you know, I think you're smarter than that. In fact, I know you're smarter than that. If it were simply put to you in simple English, you can either keep this risk uh, of having too little. What's the one big risk that everybody worries about in their, their uh, 60s and 70s? Running out of money. Yep. It's, it's, called, it's called longevity risk. And let me interject right here. One of the things that I do is I try, and I think one of my, my skills is to simplify annuities and how they are explained. I've come up with an easy acronym called PIL that explains transfer of risk. P stands for principal protection, I stands for income for life, L stands for legacy, and the other L stands for confinement care, long-term care. If you don't need to transfer risk to solve for one or more of those issues, principal protection, income for life, legacy, long-term care, confinement care, you don't need an annuity in my opinion. And if I was the advertising agency for the annuity industry of which John Olson would be the annuity czar, it would be a very simple ad, John. It would be a take on the Got Milk ad. If we all remember the Got Milk, where they had celebrities and they had the milk mustache, Got Milk, the ad would say this, Got Guarantees? Question mark. I have a t-shirt that I wear around. That's what people are looking for. I had someone ask me the other day, John, how's business, Stan the Annuity Man? Well, we're, we're doing record numbers. Why? because the demographic tidal wave of people looking for contractual guarantees could care less about politics, they could care less about interest rates, they could care less about stock market. All they care about is chapter two of their lives and they want guarantees, period. Yes. And essentially fixed annuities 
are all about guarantees. And one other thing, they, uh, he mentioned the word mortality risk. There is one thing that's interesting. If an, if an annuity is giving you a uh, projected return of 5.1% and the CDs out there are 4% and you say, this looks too good to be true, how can they do it? Here's how they can do it. The insurance company sells an annuity to 1 million people and they know that they have to reserve, that is to say, set aside Mm -hmm. enough funds to pay the income that they have guaranteed to all million people. But they don't have to have enough to, to do that for the next 40 years. Why? Because some of them won't be here in 40 years. Right. Those who don't make it, those who die along the way, the money that the insurance company would have had to pay those people can now be paid to the, the people who didn't die. That's why mortality risk or, or longevity risk, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually the, the, it's the same. same it's, it's the same thing. There, are, there is only one thing on the planet that can give you that risk, and that's annuities. No and I agree with that, John. And one of the things I tell people all the time, one of the biggest misconceptions, and again, the annuity industry has done a poor job with this, is a lot of people will think, well, Stan the annuity man and John Olson, if I die, the evil annuity company keeps the money. No, you don't have to structure it that way. You can structure it so that the annuity company is on the hook. I want people to really lean in and listen to what I'm getting ready to say. You can structure the lifetime income stream so that the annuity company is on the hook to pay as long as you're breathing, if it's joint life, as long as both of you, either one of you are breathing. But when you pass or when that second person passes away, you can contractually structure the policy so that 100% of any unused money goes to the beneficiaries and the annuity company does not keep a penny. I need people to be clear about that. I repeat that 15 times a day to people, John, that think that the money goes poof when you die. Yes, that's one way to structure it, but 99% of the people that we work with do not structure what's called life only. Um, right. And, and Stan, I just was looking yesterday. Uh, I get Canex, uh, which is a, uh, a thing for professionals in annuities. And I was looking at their report for the first quarter of 2021 and the kind of annuities that people bought. And something like 60% of the people who bought annuities bought the thing Stan just described. It's called cash refund. And it says this, I'm going to pay you for as long as you live or for as long as you and your spouse live. Right. If you don't get back the amount of money that was put on income mm -hmm. that, that, that you had at that time, then the balance is going to be paid to your beneficiary in a check. Over half the people, very few people, uh, get life only. Although, by the way, if you have nobody that you care about, <laughs> you're single, exactly. and either that or you have children but you don't like them, uh, and you can say, I want the insurance company to be able to stop paying whenever I die. And that then will give you the single highest guaranteed income available for life on the planet. There is no other instrument that can do that. But most people look at that and say, what if I die next month? So the cash refund option that Stan has described is, I don't believe, uh, I've sold two life onlys in my entire career. They were both unmarried with no children sure. that wanted the highest income they could get. Everybody else, uh, the the you can structure them the way that you want when you they're hear customizable. I tell people that that all the time. I wanted to to pivot a little bit, John. We've been around a long time, both of us, uh, and we've been in the industry for for a long, long time. Um, anytime there's low a low interest rate environment, that's when banks and brokerage firms and annuity companies come up with with um, products out of midair. I mean, they just kind of invent them to, to attract customers and attract premium. 
one of the go-go products right now that's being sold primarily in banks and brokerage firms is what's called a buffered annuity. Now, John, you're going to get a kick out of this because I call it a copay annuity <laughs> because it is kind of like a copay because what you're, what they're saying is you're going to get a little bit extra upside as compared to an index annuity. But, but if it goes down, you might have to share in that downside risk, which what, i.e. the copay, I am, I am, I can't wait to hear your take on what these buffered annuities, what, what do you think about buffered annuities? See, I get a lot of calls on them. I don't sell them for a lot of reasons. I don't believe in the concept. What's your take on buffered annuities, John? Well, first of all, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Copay sounds, sounds right. <laughs> the problem with, with, but they're also called structured annuities. The same I thing. I understand. I just think copay drives home the fact because you're, you're, you're sharing in the risk. Right. If you have one of these annuities, typically you'll say this, we're going to give you more interest than you would have gotten from an, a straight index annuity. Sure. And if it loses money, We'll, we'll absorb the first 10% or 15% or 20%. Right. You get to select that. And then if, the, if there's a really bad year and it drops more than that amount, you're on the hook for the excess. What strikes me is that's backwards. Yes, because, it is. Because what do you want to protect yourself against? A minor loss or a catastrophic loss? Because if you select, let's say, a 10% loss, and, be, and they're going to eat the 10%, and the, uh, and the market goes down 38%, which it has done before in sure. one year, you're stuck with 28% of that loss. That's going to hurt a lot more than if you had said, no, I'll take the 10 But they don't give you that option. Not only that, they are complicated because most of them are tracking indexes that haven't been around for a while. Yep. They have no track record. And to understand them uh, requires go buy the book, Index Annuities, A Suitable Approach. Jack and I wrote that because of the fact that these products were so complicated, nobody knew how they worked. Well, but and yeah. also too, these are great bull market products, John. The, these are fear products sold in a bull market. And meaning that everyone's jittery about the, the, the rise of the markets, um, but they want to protect their downside. That's kind of the fear approach with, with too many index annuity um, presentations um, as well. But the point is with the buffered annuities, I just challenge anyone to explain the, to the detail what they own. From a 30,000 foot view, I guess it looks pretty good. But if you know the details of it, then, then I challenge you to, to validate the purchase of it. And for any advisors that do happen to be listening and want to challenge me on that, come on, bring it. Um, I have no problem uh, you know, arguing that point. Um, but I just think that buffered annuities, people aren't getting what they think they're getting. And it, and it bothers I, I, me. But let, but let me ask you one more. You brought something up that I, I'm dying to hear your take on. I'm not a big fan of these, these indices, indexes, created out of midair based on an algorithmic backtest to look for a return. You, what drives me crazy, John, is, is, is you'll have a, a presentation. Someone will call me and say, well, this guy presented me this index annuity or buffered annuity with this this index, it hadn't been around, but if I'd have owned it 10 years ago, this is what I would have made. How's that even possible? <laughs> I mean, how do you back test something that's never been around? Well, is that as it, disturbing to you as it is to me? Well, it is disturbing. They use proxies and they say, well, uh, this is, hasn't been around for a while, but it, that index tracks X and X has been around for a while. So we'll use X. The, the problem is, if somebody has to say, but you would have gotten this and it hasn't uh, been around, that should be enough for you to say thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but, but they are selling them. Transfer of risk and guarantees. That's what it's about. When you're 95 years old and you're still alive, you can't work at Walmart. You, you, know, you need that income and you need it 
to persist for as long as you live, no matter what. And you can't do that with these products that get cute. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I um, also wanted to ask you about the word fiduciary. And it, it drives me a little crazy because I think fiduciary, which is the, the Southern definition of that is putting the client's interest ahead of yours as the selling agent or advisor. In my opinion, that should be automatic and involuntary. If you're in the financial services business, you should be a fiduciary period with everything that you do. But that's not the case in a lot of cases. And the fiduciary seems like the next hammer of regulation that's coming down. Maybe it's well, maybe we need it. What's your take on this whole fiduciary argument and how it's going to affect the financial services um, industry? Okay, well, first of all, there is fiduciary is, is a standard of care that, as Stan says, means that the fiduciary has put your interests ahead of his or her own. That's the, the basis. But the fiduciary standard, there's not one, there are several. For example, a lawyer has a fiduciary duty, but it's not the same duty as a portfolio manager. Right. They have different things. But the fiduciary standard in the financial services industry that, by the way, applies to all investment advisors by definition, it also applies to anybody who claims to have special expertise. A lot of agents don't know this, but if I'm a CLU, Chartered Life Underwriter, uh, or a CFP, for example, I'm not, but there are a lot of them out there, you have to agree to be a fiduciary in order to get that designation. Right. But most insurance agents are subject to that so-called suitability standard. But that's changed, folks. In two thousand since June of 2020, if you're recommending an annuity, you're going to have whether it's qualified or non-qualified in a whatever mm -hmm. you're going to have to deal with best interest because the naic model reg and the state uh, that have adopted it will will adopt that fundamental thing that says you have to put the client's interest first and by the way that model regulation that you and i talked about stan that uh the, your agents will be subject to that says that not only they have to put your interest first well my i'm the only agent i don't deal with agents because you know the, the, the well, consumer I'm, I'm yeah people yeah your, your, your consumers right the agents that do you deal with they're going to, to have that d duty of putting your interest first, but they're going to have more. They're going to have to give you documents that describe what they've recommended, right. why they've recommended it, and believe it or not, whether they're licensed with one company, two companies, or two companies more and more, but they only write with one, they have to do all of that. They have to tell you how they're compensated, and if you ask, they have to tell you what their compensation is. That yeah, I, on the compensation side, I have a great idea for the industry that could solve a lot of problems, but it'll never happen because it makes too much sense. And that is if every single annuity type, once again, there's many different types of annuities, but if all annuity types had the same commission level, preferably low, then that would take out the, the drive for some agents to push a product based on a high commission. I, I, I think that solves the, the problem. I don't think that will ever go through, but if, if you think about it, if the immediate annuity had the same commission level as the MIGA, which had the same commission level as the index annuity, which had the same commission level as a deferred income annuity or a QLAC, then it was going to force literally the agent or advisor to, a, to recommend the suitable product that would provide the best solution contractually for the goal. I know that's never gonna happen, John, but what's your take on that? Well, here we have to disagree. And uh oh, reason, here we go. All right. And the reason for that is this there are some products that require ongoing monitoring. And the commission structure that most people have is wrong. It it's it it's it's all up front. Most agents get that. If they sell an annuity, they get the whole thing up front 
and there's nothing and, going and, on. And let's stop there for, and I've told this to people before, but this is a good time to drive that home again. The fact that that commission is, is not, is, if you put a hundred thousand dollars in any type of annuity, you're going to see a hundred thousand dollars on your statement, even though the agent got paid, you can call it hidden. You can call it built in. You can call it part of the administrative cost, but it is what it is, but keep going on some need ongoing management. Okay. Uh, there are products, variable deferred annuities, for example, or index annuities with uh, where there's a choice of indices. Sure. A prudent agent will every year be meeting with the client and saying, let's see how that index worked and perhaps you want to have more than one index, et cetera. What is needed, and I'm sure Stan will agree with this, is to have the compensation uh, mirror the work that you're doing. I used to tell wholesalers who tried to get me to sell their products, I said, no trail, no sale. What does that mean? It meant I don't want 6% up front. I want a certain amount every year because I'm going to be earning it every year. There, the problem is that there are products that need to that and there are products that need absolutely none. And right. No, I agree. It's kind of like when, yeah, I agree with, I agree with that, but I do think that too many sales and recommendations are based with, with, you know, the, the bad agents out there that are just looking at the highest commission. I have internal wholesalers call me all the time and they get frustrated because most agents call in and say, what's the highest commission product out there I can sell. And then they go do a, a square peg and a round hole selling, which is, which is, um, which is kind of sad. I do think that the annuity industry is going to more of a direct consumer model, which I've pioneered out here. Um, so, you know, when John talks about meeting with the client, you know, we do that via zoom and we do that via, uh, on the phone and have clients in all 50 states. I do think that eventually the annuity industry will will be headed down that path. Right now, it's it's early, and you know, as they say, John, pioneers take all the arrows, and we're we're that we're those people. But I do think the commoditization of what annuities are commodities, in my opinion. Once people figure out that you you need to shop for annuities like you shop for a plane ticket. Um, I think that the industry, it'll be a better industry and more pro-consumer industry as opposed to, you know, this is the, this is the hot product that you need to sell right now based upon what a, an internal wholesaler is pushing you to do. Well, I certainly agree with Stan that the commission structure for annuities needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. It needs to be changed because it doesn't mirror the work that is done. I disagree with him in that I would not pay the same commission for something that requires ongoing monitoring as, as for a product that it's fire and forget. You don't need it. But I'm, why, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Why, why not have the annuity? Uh, frankly, if you paid a percentage every year, that would work. But let me address what Stan had said about they need to change. This, that's already happening, and here's why. In the new NAIC model regulation, that agent not only has to tell you what he's selling you, he has to tell you what he didn't sell you and why. And that's going to allow you, the consumer, to, to, to be able to be more confident that this guy is not selling simply the highest product, because if he is, then he's going to have real trouble being honest on those forms that he has to give you. But, no, so, I, but it, totally it is a problem. I, I, it, to, I totally agree. Um, John, we're coming up on the, on the end of the segment, but I wanted you to kind of, if you want to give some last words to the, um, to the viewers and the listeners from a consumer standpoint on just you know, annuities in general and where you see the industry headed um, and mm -hmm. why it's important for them to understand that. Okay, thank you. Uh, pure, uh, unadulterated self-interest. This is my-, well, my whole, um, For the podcast listeners, um, for the viewers, they just saw him hold up a book. For the podcast listeners, he just held up a book called John Olson's Guide to Annuities for the Consumer. Once again, we'll have that link on our site where you can go purchase that, but that would be a good go-to source and an objective resource whether you're considering me as your agent 
or someone else is your agent and advisor, that's certainly that's certainly where to go. Anything else, John? Yeah, well, where where are we headed? We're headed to more regulation. We're headed to much, much more a scrutiny of suitability. And one thing that's interesting is there are two diametrically opposed trends happening in the same time in the same industry. You have people saying, we have to go get back to the basics. We're gonna start selling uh, products that, that don't have a lot of whistles and bells. In fact, we're gonna stop selling the stuff that has whistles and bells. And you have another company right across the street that says, we've gotta have a new thing with whistles and bells. Both trends are happening. Yeah. We don't know who's gonna win. No, I, I agree with that. I think the, the industry is changing. You know, on, a, on, a, on a, another podcast we'll have you on, we'll talk about more about the trends and where me and you are predicting where things are going to go. But mm -hmm. I really do appreciate you being on, John. I mean, once again, John Olson, annuity royalty, definitely. And he knows his stuff. And I'm just so glad that he's a, a good resource for us. And once again, we'll have him, uh, we'll have a specific page for him permanently on our site. So you can, you know, go to his site. You can link to his site. You can link to his books if you want to buy them. You can replay this this um this podcast but john i really appreciate you being here and thanks everyone for joining me on the number one annuity podcast on the planet fun with annuities thanks for listening to fun with annuities please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at the annuityman.com where you can run your own spia dia and qlac quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get and that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of so join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet fun with annuities